podcast. Great to have you with us. My name is Reverend David McGinley, and I'm chaplain with the cancer program at the QE2 Health Sciences Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and uh, it's great to have you joining us. We have with us today a very interesting interview, uh, a cancer journey that may be quite unique. Um, Michael Kovarek is an author, uh, the host of an online radio program, um, and a survivor of male breast cancer. So every year, about 300,000 uh, new cases of breast cancer will, uh, will be diagnosed, and uh, women throughout uh, North America will be going through treatment. And only about 2,500 uh, um, men will be diagnosed with this, and it can feel so strange because the prominence of breast cancer the funding it receives, the profile it has, um, is not something that one would uh, think of in terms of men having cancer. That's, of course, usually prostate cancer, one of the most common amongst men and uh, than all the other varieties. There are over 200 different kinds of cancer. And we see as cancer diseases progress, they are getting more adaptable and shifting and um, diversifying. And so I'm really pleased to welcome Michael with us, who's going to be uh, sharing his story and uh, insights on the, the cancer journey, which are universal despite or, or, or across the continuum of cancer types. So welcome, Michael. Uh, hello, David. Thank you so much. So, Michael, you are, uh, you are based in, in where? In uh, Greenwich, New York, which is about an hour north of Albany, close to the Vermont border. Yeah. And um, Michael had uh, been diagnosed in 2006, uh, as I understand, is that correct? Uh, 2007, January of 2007. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it's very interesting. Our, our, you know, our readers can go to um, your, your website and uh, your, your radio show, but uh, We'll, we'll stay um, we'll stay here and explore it and, and find out this intriguing story and how you access your deepest inner healing. That's that's always the most exciting thing to explore. So as yeah. we move into that, we always have a moment of uh, grounding and mindful presence because we really want to open the heart and the mind to uh, the lessons that we're going to be uh, exploring today. So Michael and uh, for our viewers online, I invite you to join us as we center ourselves and get ready to engage in this conversation. So to do so, get comfortable, feel yourselves planted on your chair, breathe down into your belly, you can close your eyes, and I encourage you simply to pay attention to this moment. Be aware of your breathing. Be aware of any sounds that might be in your environment. Feel your heart beating in your chest. Be open. And if where you're listening, you hear any distracting noises, be open to them. They are part of what is here now. And develop an intention of perception and curiosity to discover perhaps part of your own story in this interview. Okay. So with that, take us back to 2007. <laughs> oh, it's been it's been quite a journey. Um, I noticed the lump in uh, on my chest at the end of 2006, and uh, being the person who I was back then, I was terrified to even know what was wrong. And finally, I uh, did go to my GP, who um, had said to me at the time, you know, I think it's a cyst. Uh, because back then there was really nothing out there about male breast cancer. 
And, uh, and he's like, you know, we could have it removed and that. And who I was at the time, I was like, no, 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 we'll just wait, we'll just wait. And it was a few months later when my left nipple inverted that I knew something was wrong. It's my fear and face this. And so I went to my GP who immediately sent me to a surgeon. And, you know, a week, they removed the lump. A week later, I'm going back for, um, you know, for the results. And, you know, I went by myself because, you know, friends were saying, like, don't you want to have somebody with you? And I was like, it's a cyst, you know. It's, it's just not going to be anything. And so it was very, very mind-boggling for me when the surgeon sat there and he said, you know, Michael, you have cancer. And, um, and even then, it would, what was interesting was uh, the lab reports were saying that they felt it had come from my chest, from my lungs. Because, uh, and my surgeon, who I think had been in close contact with my GP, who, who knew me very well, and they both felt at that point that it, that it wasn't from my lungs, it was breast cancer. And I'm, I remember sitting there going, breast, bre breast cancer, that, that's a woman's disease. You know, how does that, how did I get breast cancer? And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so, um, you know, at that point, then everything just kind of went to me. They did um, everything. And we found out that it was breast cancer. My GP had me do an x-ray of my lungs. There was nothing there then. And... Um, and that started the journey on breast cancer. And the first, you know, from 2007 to uh, for a couple of years, I was very much in denial. I mean, my whole thing was I was on tamoxifen. I was like, okay, just tell me what I need to take. Let me get to that five-year mark. Let me be done with this. And I, you know, I knew nothing about male breast cancer. I had no interest in finding out about breast cancer, male breast cancer. I just from fear wanted it to be done. And then uh, in 2000 recurrence, and uh, prior to the recurrence, I'm um, educating myself in a sense of starting to look at, I started reading books by um, uh, Louise Hay and started really looking at, um, you know, looking at healing in a much different way and in a sense of more of my responsibility in my healing and how empowering myself in my healing. And, and so um, my oncologist in 2010 saw something in the scar of the previous surgery and didn't like it, put me, you know, had me do a, um, go for a ultrasound, decided to take a biopsy. I kind of knew what was going on. And um, at that point, they, uh, it was interesting because when I got the call, I got the call the Wednesday before our Thanksgiving in November in 2010, uh, the Wednesday night. And I remember just sitting there and I just kind of fell apart. And um, my partner, Tim, was working. I was home with the two dogs and I just kind of went into my living room and just fell apart. It was like, you know, how could this happen again? And I remember all of a sudden just hearing my voice going, you need to go deeper. You need to go much deeper inside of yourself and find the cause of this. And so it started me on this journey of really looking at my spirituality, really looking at connecting with my own empowerment, uh, where my first part, my first journey after the first diagnosis was really denial and I gave all my power to the doctors, gave all my power to the, the drug. And, and I just wanted to get to that five year mark. And what, when you've given over your power, of course, you, your original diagnosis, you are brought into the medical machinery. Yes. And the, the whole system. Now for, for, for women that involves a mammogram that involves genetic testing. Was it any different for you? Uh, no, which is which I give so much credit to my initial oncologist who was phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. She had, um, because my dad had passed away from pancreatic cancer, she did the BRCA test on me, and I found out that I have the BRCA2 gene. Uh, she also 
and she also encouraged uh, my mom, my brother, and my sister to get tested, and they were all negative. So, so it pretty much, your down to, yeah, it came down from my father, which is also was very mind boggling for a lot of people because that wasn't something that people were very much aware of that it could come from the, you know, your father's side, the male side of the family. And, um, and so because of that, we were trying to be very more proactive. Uh, she hooked me up with a gastroenterologist. I go and have my pancreas checked each year. Uh, through an ultrasound and through uh, uh, MRI and a urologist and so on because what I learned at that point then was that I was more susceptible to other cancers uh, along with breast cancer but I was more ex uh, more susceptible to the more aggressive forms of those cancers so we wanted to be more proactive in that sense yeah, suddenly and, your world, um, you're, you're no longer safe yeah. in your world and you're always watching. Yeah. yeah, and you know, and the difference was, David, was with the second diagnosis, um, at that point, my initial oncologist had uh, retired and was shifted to someone else. And it wasn't, it, there was so much I learned from this oncologist because it, it really, uh, I never really connected with her. Excellent doctor, but there was just no personal connect my original oncologist. And she, at that point, uh, oxifen and put me on Lupron, which is a, a drug that they use for prostate cancer because they don't know what to do with men when the cancer comes back and they've been on tamoxifen. Um, I had also been doing mammograms on my right side as a precaution, which was very interesting going for those. Um, and I had such into the Lupron. Uh, within a week of the first shot, I was just experiencing very intense side effects. And we would go back and forth. When I would tell my oncologist about that, her response was, we'll put you on this other drug in addition to the Lupron to take care of this. And I was like, I don't want another drug. This drug is doing enough. Uh, long story short, I ended up stopping the Lupron. I made the choice to stop it. And I started doing a lot of more holistic things with acupuncture, Reiki, energy work, um, massage, and someone like that. And I also switched oncologists to someone who was more open to what I was feeling. And so one of the things that came out once I stopped is they had asked if I would be would have a mastectomy on the right side as a precaution. And, um, and one of my um, alternative doctors had also suggested that. So I trusted them and I went and talked to my sir, good idea since I wasn't doing the drug. And so we did that and I was feeling great and doing everything. And then uh, in 2015, um, I started noticing a cough. And yes, and the cough was getting bad. And, and in between that, I should back up and I apologize for jumping ahead. But in between that, the second time I, I wrote my book, Healing Within My Journey with Breast Cancer, and that I, I took an early retirement from teaching. And, uh, and then I also got connected with the Male Breast Cancer Coalition who reached out to me because there was an article in the paper up by me out of Glens Falls, New York. And they reached out, and I never even knew that this organization was there. It had just started. And they have been a lifeline for me and, and for many other men because it is something you don't, you know, it's not, you know, you, as you said in the beginning, male breast cancer is just not something you hear a lot about. And through them, I started reading about other men who had gone through this ordeal. Because I had still, at that point, not met another male breast cancer survivor. Yes, with only 3,000. And uh, so I started, yeah, yeah. And, and so, it, you know, the numbers are so small. And, and the fact is that I'm living in northern New York, um, not near, you know, I'm not near New York City, which has, you know, you're going to probably be apt to connect with somebody. But even there, I think it was only through the Male Breast Cancer Coalition that a couple other men did. 
But I got very involved with them, and um, they have a wonderful website, the Male Breast Cancer Coalition org, and on there are story. And I think now there's well over fifty stories of of men of sharing their journey. But anyway, uh, so I I started becoming more involved and realizing I needed power in my heal, how I was choosing to live, and how I was choosing my emotions, how I was choosing to react to things, if I was holding on to anger or resentment. The neatest thing that kind of came from all of this, David, was growing up gay and Catholic in the 60s and the 70s was just not a really good uh, connection. And, uh, and so I had a lot of baggage with that. And what I also did was in, in kind of letting go of my religion, I let go of my spirit, equated them as the same. And it was through a lot of my reading with Deepak Chopra, with Louise Hay, with uh, Wayne Dyer, and many, many others, that I started realizing that spirituality and, and religion are quite separate and quite different. And I started connecting with that. You know, so and can you, say oh, more, can you say more about that in terms of, um, of your spirituality? How did your spirituality become animated? What is it for you? Uh, because it's unique for each person. It, yeah, it's, it's, oh gosh, it is. I think that has probably been one of the most amazing part is reconnecting with that and feeling a connection to a higher power, feeling a, a connection to earth, feeling a connection to nature and realizing that it was my it was my way of how I wanted that connection to be. It wasn't somebody else's, uh, you know, format. It was definitely my, of how I wanted to connect. And, and I realized that and what it was also doing was giving me such a boost in my healing. And, and not so much my healing, um, f you know, physically, it's much more emotionally which in a turn helps your physical aspect. And, and so it's been such a, a rewarding uh, journey for me. You know, I meditate every day. I just really kind of connect. I really look at how I'm choosing to live and what is important to me, you know, kindness, compassion, um, all, these, all these things that make life wonderful you know and enjoying enjoying the people around me and so i was really you know from 2010 to 2015 i'm sorry yeah yeah I, well i'm wondering and in, in terms of the compassion and the, and the love and the forgiveness and um you know you practice that for other people of course but was there a shift in how you felt and practice that for yourself Uh, yeah, I think self-forgiveness was an amazing gift I gave myself with this. Uh, learning to love myself, which I had not done most of my life. Uh, learning to love who I am and, and to realize um, it was important what I thought of myself, not what other people thought of me. And, and that there was this goodness here, and that's what you go by. And, you know, I had a, I had a very tough upbringing, I, not a very good connection with my dad until right before he died, and realized I had a lot of anger with him. And it was through that whole work with forgiveness, with this awakening of my spirituality, that I was really able to forgive him and to forgive myself for how we both chose to go down that path. And it's been a wonderful, rewarding gift to myself, yeah. you know? And, and so I really just really worked on all, of, on all of those things to make me the person deep inside and, and that I was okay. And interestingly enough, um, 
you know, at that point I was going, all my blood work was great. All my, all my doctors felt I was doing fantastic. I felt good. And then, uh, you know, th during the year 2015, I started noticing a cough that was very similar to my acid reflux cough because I had stopped doing acupuncture for a while and that had always taken care of it. And the women that uh, run that really kind of are the soul behind the male breast cancer coalition kept saying to me when we would talk and that, you know, Michael, you, you really need to get this cough checked out. I'm like, it's my acid reflux cough. All my blood work is great. All my doctors are telling me I'm great. But thankfully they kept after me and I started realizing that it was getting worse and it wasn't going away. And uh, last September, uh, when I was in for my endoscopic ultrasound for my pancreas, thankfully I mentioned to my gastroenterologist that, you know, I have this cough, it's not going away, it's like my acid reflux, and he's like, you know, Michael, I'll take a look as we're going down. And he found uh, an abnormal, a couple of abnormal lymph nodes in my chest cavity. And so they did a biopsy and we found out that the cancer was back. And at that point, it, it's considered stage four metastatic because it had spread to my chest cavity and then my lungs. And I was like, okay, and interestingly, and I think, and I believe a lot of it was with the work that I had done uh, since the beginning of this journey. It was like, you know, the first couple of times at stage one, the first two diagnoses, I fell apart. And when Tim and I were sitting there and my oncologist is saying, well, it's considered stage four, it's metastatic breast cancer. And I was like, okay, what do we need to do? You know, and I was in a, such a different place, which was wonderful. And, um, and so we just kind of talked over some things. And right now what I am doing is I am actually going to the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston and uh, working there. And I'm on a oral chemo drug right now and uh, a drug that also works with my estrogen. But I'm also even much more in tune to my spirituality now than even after my second diagnosis. And I think a lot of that is, uh, and I think it's helping me deal with this because, you know, I think as you know, with your volunteer work with the Cancer and Healing Foundation, stage four, there's this sense of finality that you get from the medical community. And I remember just sitting there and even my oncologist, you know, was saying, you know, we're gonna treat this as a chronic disease. And, and I'm sitting there going, Okay, I understand, you know, in my head, I'm just going, I understand what you're saying. My vision is different. I'm on a different path. And I'm going to trust that there's a reason why I need to be on this path. And I'm going to be okay. And if anything, it's, it's, it's given me even more of an incentive to kind of go out and, and talk about and, and make awareness. Because not only is it about male breast cancer, but it's now also metastatic male breast cancer as well as metastatic cancer, which are two areas, the metastatic cancer and the male breast cancer that are so minimally funded for research. Um, and, and I don't know if that is kind of the same format in Canada as here in the States that those areas are not as well funded as like the awareness campaign as here, like in the States, you know, um, it is, um, it, it is uh, an area that people are becoming aware of, but um, it just doesn't get the profile and the funding. Um, it's um, yeah, cancer is cancer is such a cultural phenomenon, and still yeah. people see it within a certain paradigm, within a certain understanding, and uh, you know uh, that applies to the the broadest sense. A person on chemotherapy or radiation can look like a normal person. They don't have to have lost all their hair. Um, they don't have to be a very thin individual. Uh, and although those happen later on in treatment, but um, there is a profound dissonance that comes when comforting friends will say, oh, you look great, or, you know, oh, th things must be going really well, but they don't really know what's going on inside your world. I just want to... Uh, mention again to our listeners and our viewers or what we're talking with uh, Michael Kavarak who is the author of a cancer book called Healing Within My Journey with Breast Cancer 
um, and it's available on Amazon. And Michael has also uh, got a radio program, and that is the, um, I'm just pull that up, Dream Visions 7 Radio Network, and that is uh, dreamvision7radio.com, and you can put in Michael Kavarik and uh, hear fantastic interviews and uh, conversations he's having about activating the spiritual dimension of the, the cancer journey, uh, connecting through complementary and alternative, but also mindfulness, compassion, listening to your life, Cancer is dragging you uh, to the hard lessons that needed to be addressed all along, but we tend to put them aside and avoid them. And cancer is saying, no, you got to go deep and you got to do your homework because uh, time is short and this is really important, which means the homework is usually hard. It's addressing the shadow aspects of our life, the places of woundedness. And Michael, you went there. You... You mentioned that you reconciled with your father, but your father had died. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it is so true. It's, it's going, it's a journey of making yourself vulnerable and going to those places, those dark places deep inside. Um, and that's where the healing comes from. And, you know, I think, you know, in our culture, being vulnerable is always seen as a weakness. And to me, it's the place where you are your strongest when you are vulnerable, because that's when you have to dig deep, deep, deep inside. I think one of the things that amazed me from the beginning of this journey, and especially after this third diagnosis in September, was the strength that I, I never realized I had inside of me. Um, and, and, and I think so many people going through any kind of disease, is, that's one of the things that I think we, we find is the beautiful strength that is, that is there inside of each one of us. And, it, and it's when we go to those dark places and we sit with it and we're mindful of it and we be with it and not, I did my whole life. I just would squash it down inside. And it's more now of just being with it and letting it work its way through. And that's the way that you are able to deal with it. And that's the way you're able to face it. And that's the compassionately let it go. This, this is an aspect of inner healing that um, uh, is not promoted in our culture and often even in our churches. Your ability to be compassionately present with the darkest wounds of your heart doesn't change the history, but it changes your relationship to your own experience in this moment. And... Um, I've, I've mentioned before on these podcasts, we spend a great deal of energy avoiding ourselves in our daily lives. And then you get a diagnosis of cancer, you start taking cancer treatment to fight for more moments of life, but you're avoiding the moment that you're in mm -hmm. because it's hard. You, you connected to that deep inner work. It resulted in reconciliation with your father. It resulted in becoming a more integrated individual. How is it now you are sitting here with us, you have fourth stage breast cancer. How yeah. is it now? It is, you know, it has been my, it has been my anchor being able to do that, being able to look at things compassionately. I, it was interesting. I was with um, actually Deborah, who is the owner of the Devon uh, radio station. And, and I'm actually going to be uh, moving on from there uh, in, after June, but kind of coming back periodically and doing things. But we, I've been having some phenomenal conversations with Deborah. She's a very intuitive individual. And in the midst of my conversation with her, at one point I heard myself saying to her, I feel more alive now than I've ever felt in my life. And I think it's, be, and I know it's because I have to be more in touch with me, even more so now. And 
and more comfortable looking in and and more comfortable with who I am at this moment. And that has kept me going. Um, it has really helped me in this path of my journey of living more fully, of living in more lovingly, of living and, and finding a more of a purpose for what I would like to do and what I would like to achieve. Um, the simplest things like, uh, you know, I was telling her, I said, I will go out and because we live out in the country, like when I let the dog out at night and I'm looking up at the stars and, you know, I find myself all of a sudden starting to cry because it's like, this is so beautiful. And I'm so grateful for that. You know, I'm so grateful that I'm allowing myself to truly feel that beauty. No, to be Where so many of us don't, you know. You know, deeply authentic, deeply engaged in this moment. Um, mm. that, that is an active uh, and critical part of spirituality. Uh, and it is, in, of course, in religious traditions. However, it's, um, it's, it's a poverty of our culture. We, we often don't know how to speak about that, but universally experienced, everybody can recall moments when they either looked at the stars or a sunset or just had an ordinary moment that became extraordinary because they were suddenly deeply open to it. And of course, that is where God is or where the divine consciousness is. It's, it's not in the next moment or the last one. It's only and ever has been in this moment. So <laughs> you connect to this moment and you are, of course, connecting to something much deeper and greater than you. And then you look out at the expanse of the stars and I imagine you right your tears and you could disappear into that wonder. Yeah. It's, it's amazing in that sense, you know, and, and I love that word you used authentic. It's, it's really learning and being mindful of being authentic as much as you possibly can. You know, and not losing yourself within the hubbub of everything that's going on in life, you know. And, and the hubbub of what's going on up here because the mind will, um, will deceive you. <laughs> we will, we're experts in owning ourselves, aren't we? Um, but the body, the body won't lie to you. The body will say the truth and the emotions yeah. will be in there. And, and you have been on that journey of trying to figure out, okay, my body is now speaking to me. My soul's talking to me through my body. How did my biography become my biology? How did I participate mm -hmm. in the unfolding of this? Um, which is, uh, again, I've said it before on these programs, it's not a purely individualistic thing. We live in a toxic culture uh, and, you know, we move through a sea of, of um, psychic and and um, environmental pollution and so that's going to affect you but you also participate in the unfolding of every moment yeah yeah now, a lot of people may, may hear that and they they worry then um, how did I contribute to my disease but the, that whole lesson is always inviting us to ask the other question how do I participate in my wholeness what do I need to do for my heart and my life right now to find joy and love? Yeah. How do you do that? Um, you know, I think through meditation, yeah. you know, uh, through, through my daily meditation and just being quiet. Um, you know, a friend said to me at uh, one point, which was, so enlightening to me when I was talking to them about, and I said, you know, I know people are going to be crossing my path that are going to kind of help guide me to where I need to be. And, and this person said to me, you know, Michael, you have the answers right inside of you. You know, it's, it's just being still and listening. And that was such uh, an interest, you know, that was like, I, I was sat there going, oh my gosh, yeah. You know, through, through that, I think, 
um, you know, and I think talking about it, and I think, you know, like, unfortunately, a lot of people in our culture, like you were saying, you know, they, they kind of, they kind of go and it's, it's kind of us and that that are going to get me healthy. And we forget about the spiritual part of ourselves that need healing and that need to need compassion. And, you know, I think a lot of people also will look at it at times, unfortunately, David, and, you know, like when we talk about, okay, what was, what was my part in this journey of, of the cancer coming? And it's not taking blame for that. Because I was doing the best, and everybody does, they do the best that they can every day with what they know. It's what you do, you know, like what you guys talk about on, on the podcasts. And it's what you do when these situations are in front of you. And it's like, okay, how can I empower myself to change? I mean, I, I saw myself you know, very angry, very resentful, very bitter about different things. And I realized it was like, that was just poison that I was keeping within myself. And I had to look at that and say, I don't, you know, I don't want that poison. So how that was clogging your spiritual uh, arteries, that was spiritual cholesterol. Yeah. How do yes. you- Yes, I like that. <laughs> How did, how did you clean it out? I think it was, and, and, and it's an ongoing journey. It's, it's really looking at my choices. You know, it's looking at um, how I'm choosing to be each day. And if, and if, am I being my true authentic self as much as I possibly can? Uh you know, also looking at this situation and saying, okay, what is it that I can do to make it better? And in this sense, I could easily have, knowing the person that I was, who just sat back and did nothing. I chose to write a book. I've been, I do some writing for the Anti-Cancer Club um, on their website, anticancerclub.com. I'm also going to be periodically co-hosting their Cancer Blab with Stephanie Zimmerman, who's one. And I realized it was also part of me to get out there and talk self in the arena. And, you know, I've gotten flack about my feelings about, you know, that there's an emotional component to this. And a lot of people don't want to look at that. Um, there's that fear of it because you're afraid. And I understand because for so many years, I did not want to look at it because I was so afraid of what I would find. And could I love that person that that is me that's inside of me and of course you can you know because you know like what we say you're you're doing the best you can each day with what you know and it's when you open yourself up you open yourself up to what other people you know what other people share about their journeys and you learn now, uh, there will be some of our listeners who are thinking, well, I know that I'm not doing the best that I can right now. And I, I just want to point out that uh, if you have that voice inside of you, then that is an aspect that is trying to do better mm -hmm. in this moment. And it's critical to ask yourself, well, how am I sabotaging myself? Why am I sabotaging myself? And if you look back, at your past and you say, well, I could have done a lot better back then. I could have done this or that. That speaks to the growth that has occurred since then. Have you, you, you've obtained the wisdom. Have you integrated the wisdom? Would you choose differently now? We are all inconsistent in the ways of love and compassion. We all trip ourselves up. Uh, it's, it's a bumpy road and it's always winding. It's, it's not consistent straight line for any of us. Uh, now you, well, the chemotherapy continues. Yeah. Did you ask the big question about prognosis? Um, you know, it's it, what I've been told from my oncologist is that they're treating this as a chronic disease and that people are living longer with chronic diseases. And, you know, my, my, feeling is and where I am right now as you know as I shared before is you know I don't sit there angry I don't I don't sit there and deny what they're saying 
I understand it. And it's more of trusting, you know, my path is different and I'm just going to take it a day at a time and, and trust that I'm on the path that I need to be on, you know, right now at this moment, which was such a hard thing for me to learn, you know, right now at this moment, I am fine. You know, right now at this moment, I am here and holding on to that and being with that and embracing that. And, um, you know, because one of the things like I, I wrote about in the book was a friend of mine, of uh, uh, Tim and mine up here, did a Buddhist study. And, uh, and I had always been interested in, in learning about the Buddhist philosophy. And it very much so was about being in the moment, being mindful. And, and one of the things that was shared at there was, you know, they had said, you know, like if you're sad or depressed, many times you're focusing on things in the past, things that you can't change. And I'm very guilty of that. And I still work on that. If you're very anxious, a lot of times you're projecting into the future. And, but it's when you're at peace is when you're at this moment. And that's what, what I strive for, you know, is to, is to just try to be in the moment and, and go with that and, and, and enjoy that and embrace it. So one, one of the qualities of being in the moment is being open to all of the realities that may, uh, that may unfold. You're able to hold life and death in your heart at the same time. You don't resist any aspect of your experience, but you also mm -hmm. don't let yourself be led down the garden path by any of those thoughts or feelings. You, yeah. you stay in this moment. Yeah. And that's then that's a, a very, you know, with our culture, which I think you know, it's such a difficult thing to do. Um, but they, it's wonderful when you are able, when you are able to be mindful of that and to do it. And, you know, what I had to learn, like, even when I first started meditate, meditation, uh, you know, when I would sit there and my mind was just going all over the place, I kept, I'm doing this wrong. It's not working. I'm not doing, and it was like, you had to start small, you know, being mindful doesn't come just like that. And, and, and even now I'm not, I'm not mindful every, every moment of the day. But it's catching yourself, you know, and being aware of it and, and realizing when my mind is going into that story of things, wait a minute, you know, right now this is where I'm at. And, and that's the wonderful thing. And I think that's what keeps you grounded. That's what keeps me grounded. And it, it helps with my healing. It is healing. You know, to me, it's the core of my healing. And we are uh, we are here right now with uh, Michael Michael Kavarik, and uh, you're listening to on the Healing and Cancer Foundation podcast. And really want to remind you of his book, a fantastic Healing from Within My Cancer Journey, My Journey with Breast Cancer, and that's on Amazon.com. And you can um, hear Michael on uh, the um, Dream Vision Seven Radio Network, and uh, you mentioned you. Be moving out from that and on to some other projects and growing yeah. and going where where this is taking you yeah, yeah. which has been amazing <laughs> it is uh it, it has taken us to, to, to the the, uh, the end of our interview i'm really really glad to chat with you about this thanks so much michael because you've touched on some very common themes we are discovering through these podcasts the central importance of mindful compassionate presence as part of your integrative practice taking the uh the recommended medication and, uh, and, and treatment plan but not stopping there um supplementing it with good exercise good sleep healthy relationships good diet mindful compassionate presence with yourself digging into the shadow lands of the heart, uh, healing the, the deeper parts of, of you beyond your body, investigating, uh, you've investigated healing energy, you, you've used Reiki, and um, discovered that you do not stop at your skin, you are so much more than your body. It has been a road of great discovery for you. Really appreciate you sharing it with us. Well, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. I've enjoyed it so much. And 
the journey continues. <laughs> journey continues for, for all of us. Uh, we wish that uh, to be a long and deep and uh, lovely journey for all of you who are listening. Thank you so much again, Michael, and thank you for our viewers. Uh, you've been listening to the Healing Cancer Foundation podcast. I'm Dave McGinley, and we'll catch you next time.